Welcome again, everyone. Um, why don't we get started? My name is Michelle Rapp from the Office of Alumni Relations, and I'm the Associate Director of Alumni Career Strategy. I'm delighted that all of you are joining us today for this webinar. Quick housekeeping information, if you do encounter any connectivity issues, um, you can use, there's a menu of three bars on the upper left-hand corner, and from that menu, it gives you an option for dialing in if you need to um, switch modes for the session. Also, for participation, you'll have the ability to participate through chat to ask questions. Um, that's available through the lower right-hand corner. There's a little purple uh, arrow there, and when you click on that, it gives you a menu, and you'll use the chat bubble icon to get to the chat box area. I'm really delighted to have Nick Nagari here with us today to talk about this really important topic of how AI and automation is going to impact us in our careers, impacting entrepreneurship, leadership, as well as creativity. A little bit about Nick. Nick is an, an optimistic futurist, a longtime teacher, and lifelong learner. He is currently co-founder and COO at Team Machine, a platform that helps people get their dream job via personalized learning plans. Nick has started two companies himself, helped in the early stages with five, and was the former head of IDEA at Northeastern. Nick also regularly mentors first-time entrepreneurs on how to find alignment with personal passion and stay hyper-focused on the things that matter on day zero of a new company. And I should mention that this is Global Entrepreneurship Week and part of why we wanted Nick to present this week. Nick also has a BS in finance with a minor in computer science from Northeastern. We're delighted to have him today to share his expertise. It's all yours. Great. Um, can everyone see me? Can you see me okay, Michelle? Yes. Great. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Nick. It's really a pleasure to be here today. Um, talking about entrepreneurship and uh, AI are two some of my absolute favorite topics. So it's a real pleasure to get to share uh, my thinking and perspective. Um, so I'm going to go through some slides. I'd also love to see uh, some interaction in the chat. Uh, Michelle's going to help me out with that. Um, so if you, if someone could just test right now to see if if the chat is working, or if anyone wants to say something in chat. Uh, let's just kind of get the ball rolling there. Uh, I'd love to make this as interactive as possible. Um, so you could type your name or you could type maybe something you're interested to learn about today or what, what drew you into this particular webinar, and then we'll get started. Hello, KJ. Thank you. I'll have, a, I'll have a prompt for everyone to share uh, things that they might want to learn from me once I share a little bit more about myself so we can use that if you're feeling inclined to that in the chat as well. Um, so I'm going to share my screen here to get started. All right. And Michelle, can you see that okay? Nick, that looks great. great. Well, I can't. Perfect. Um, Michelle, I can't see the chat while I'm talking with the presentation mode, so just let me know if there's something that comes up. Um, so today, we're going to talk about being ahead of the curve. Uh, what's coming with AI? and how to leverage AI to uh, grow in your career and the types of things that you might want to be paying attention to as uh, AI increasingly automates more roles and responsibilities. So I, I got onto LinkedIn yesterday uh, and the first thing that I saw uh, was this post which seemed relevant to share. Um, so there's, in my view there's a lot of fear mongering around AI. It says this idea was that um, it's not just blue collar jobs like Amazon warehouse automation that's going to affect the, uh, the the number of jobs that are available, but also white collar jobs, uh, management, knowledge work. Um, so I think part of the challenge here is that people don't really know what AI is. 
uh, and they don't know the way that it will impact the workforce. So I just wanted to share this as a, a pressing, you know, one day ago from Stanford uh, material to talk about how pressing and relevant this is, as many of you already know. The other side of this is that uh, our skills as professionals are uh, last less time than ever. The number of uh, years that people spend in a job these days has decreased significantly and the number of years that a skill is relevant especially technology focused skills are relevant uh, is now five years or less and that is decreasing over time so it's really important to think about how can I be a lifelong learner and prepare myself for success as uh, the the amount of automation in the world increases um, so there's three main things that we're going to focus on today. Uh, I'll tell you a little bit about my journey as an entrepreneur, my background, um, but I just want to give you a preview of the types of skills that I think are really important uh, in the age of AI. And the first one is human skills, things that humans can do that, that AI cannot. And what we're going to really focus on is the types of things that are uh, make entrepreneurs great, like being able to be creative and empathy. Uh, the second one is force multiple skills, the, the types of skills where you can create something and get leverage on that thing, primarily code or uh, pieces of software, whether or not you needed to code them. Um, I'll talk about different ways of approaching that. And then the other aspect is uh, being able to teach machines information because uh, that's going to be increasingly valuable as we use as more we use more machines that each use more information. And the last one is to develop skills around learning. So if, if our skills only last five years, then the important thing to be able to do is to be able to learn skills as we're working and to be able to predict which skills are really important uh, in, in the coming time frame so you can stay ahead of the curve. Um, so about me, uh, the types of things that you could learn from me come from my experiences uh, so far. So right now, as Michelle said, I'm, I'm the co-founder and COO of an AI startup called Team Machine. And what we're focused on is helping people uh, learn skills and develop, uh, get promotions in their career. Um, I've started, this is the second company I've started and I've worked on five, which I'll tell you about in a second. I was also the CEO of IDEA at Northeastern, so really involved in the entrepreneurship ecosystem. And when I was an undergraduate, I uh, was president of the student government. So a lot of affinity with Eastern and as people who are involved with Northeastern, I'd, I'd be really happy to uh, help you out with um, anything. If you just reach out to me, my email is at the end of the presentation. I'd be happy to follow up. So the, the categories of things that you might learn from me uh, and, and what I want to ask you in a second is, is what you want to learn. Um, the, the topics where I've kind of developed expertise are uh, customer development in the entrepreneurship process. W what should I be focused on and how do I talk to customers in a way that I can know how to serve them best? And I th think about that often as a function of empathy. How can I really sit with someone and understand what their pain is and how to, uh, how, how they live and what their world is like so that I can serve them as best as possible? Um, how to fail, uh, if not fail elegantly, um, and the importance of failing as part of learning. Uh, my first startup failed, and that was one of the most challenging experiences that I've ever had in my life. Um, it's something that is also one of the biggest learning experiences that I've had in my life. And uh, oftentimes people ask me about my experiences of failure um, because that's kind of a juicy, vulnerable bit, which not many people get the opportunity to talk about or hear about. And I'm happy to share about those experiences. Um, early stage ideation and experimentation. How do you actually go from uh, an idea that you have and start to test it? And then uh, the last one is, is what I think I bring most to the table in a startup team and otherwise is uh, my abilities as a leader. Um, so how, do, how does one lead? How does one speak strategically, uh, think strategically, and then inspire a team, form a team? That, that's something I've done several times now. And it's also things I'd be happy to talk about. Um, so I'd love to use uh, the chat a little bit here uh, to see um, what is it that you might want to learn from me today, uh, whether it's in the scope of this presentation or not. Um, and I'd be happy to just take some questions via the chat, and then I'll also open up questions throughout and, and answer questions at the end. I'm 
We've got a little typing going on there. Great. And you can access the chat from the lower right hand purple arrow menu and it's the bubble button. Great. Well, if there's nothing that's top of mind. Oh, thank you. That's a great question. Um, what made me start working on Team Machine is I care a lot about education and I care a lot about AI. Um, so my personal background, uh, about 12 years ago, I uh, saw Ray Kurzweil's video on uh, the coming singularity. And I, I'm not sure that that perspective is the most important perspective to take right now in terms of the way that uh, strong AI or AGI might come into play. But I didn't originally uh, emotionally inspired me to spend all of my time and focus on AI because I think it's going to be one of the most uh, impactful technologies in the next hundred years and especially you know, and potentially uh, in all of human history so far um, on the scale of the invention of language and writing. Um, so at that point in my life, uh, it, was, it was in 2008, I said, I'm going to dedicate all of my time to and, and, and my life to helping AI become implemented or help society transition into uh, using AI in a way that's democratic and moral. Uh, I want to make sure that, that we don't increase wealth inequality or other types of inequality with AI and that we actually make the whole world and uh, a better place for everyone in, in terms of their well-being, quality of life, education, etc. Um, and I view the intersection of um, AI and education as a really great place to start, and that's why we're working on it at Team Machine. Great. Okay. Um, white collar and tech jobs that could become obsolete through AI. What new career fields? I think the main one is um, machine teaching, um, and I think a lot more people will learn how to code, and I'll start to cover that a little bit in the presentation. So I think you'll get a satisfying answer to that. Um, how I can build, how can I build a career in AI? Uh, I work in cloud currently, wondering how to make the switch. Um, I would say that there, you want to try to isolate the specific skills that are needed within AI domains and then start to build up those skills. Uh, and I'll cover that a little bit in the third section, uh, like how to learn effectively um, and how to pick the skills effectively. And I think you'll get a satisfying answer to that too. Um, there's so much information about AI and ML that's overwhelming. Yes, yeah, so as a follow-up to the first question, uh, I would say that's a that's a general problem right now. So, from Team Machine's perspective, what we're seeing is that in the world there's so much information that it's actually hard to make sense of it all. Uh, the, one of the reasons AI is interesting is it can start to help human beings like us to sort through all of the available information to help us figure out what the most effective way to learn is. Um, and I'll show you a little bit about our product and, and how we start to do that. Um, Florian, how do you determine what types of skills are relevant for you at your stage in your career? Um, yeah, so I'll, I, as I talk about the product at the end, I'll talk about the framework that we use to do that. And you could use that regardless of using our startup. Um, the, the, anything I'm mentioning about my work on my company is to illustrate uh, what I think AI is capable of, as well as um, the general frameworks that you could use to learn. Uh, an example of one learning tool that might help you, but I'm not trying to pitch you to use the company. Um, and then at an entry level, uh, at an entry level, I would say go deep on uh, become an expert at something because team, you know, great teams are made up of experts. And but also consider that if you want to be a leader, that you have to build up those skills over time. And just jumping into a management position with no social skills or experience is not going to be very helpful. And then another thing I'll touch on is that the social skills are actually some of the ones that are the most important when automation is taking a larger and larger hold. Um, so with that, I'll jump into the presentation. Uh, and please ask questions along the way. Um, if anything comes up, then Michelle will help me out to, to point out that there's a question and we'll go from there. Um, so just want to give you a little bit of a highlight of, of kind of how I got here, given that it's Global Entrepreneurship Week. Um, first, uh, I was the CEO of IDEA. Uh, IDEA, as you all know, at, at Northeastern has uh, worked with 
uh, hundreds of new company concepts, given out million dollars of, of uh, early stage non-equity seed funding, uh, and has resulted in 65 companies fully launching and raising over $180 million combined. So it's an incredible resource um, available to students and alum and graduate students, uh, professors, everyone in the Northeastern ecosystem. So I highly recommend using that. Uh, my first uh, company out of out of undergrad was called The Catalyst, and it was focused on commercializing technologies that were invented in the university uh, ecosystem. So primarily in Boston, working with people over at uh, Harvard and MIT, as well as at Northeastern, um, some professors here. The idea was people were creating new technologies but not getting them to market, and I wanted to help with that. Um, and that was the company that ended up failing, and I'd be happy to talk about that experience. Then I went and worked for a company called Venture App, which was a, a marketplace that helped service providers connect with businesses. I was almost like uh, Yelp or Thumbtack, but from a business perspective, um, and did some product work there and some sales. Uh, after that, I went to Entangled and did consulting in the innovation of education. Um, so I had some experience working with big colleges as well as um, and tech startups that we were incubating um, and, and large corporates that wanted to sell into education uh, to help advise them on, on how to do that effectively. Uh, I did some work with a company called Zentist, uh, again, in the product capacity uh, to help uh, them better understand how much it will cost for healthcare for dental insurance and give the minimum treatment cost for all the patients. And then lastly, as I've mentioned, I'm working on a company called Team Machine, which helps uh, people learn skills as efficiently as possible and share knowledge with one another to try to create the best personalized learning plans to help advance careers. Um, so with that being said, uh, there are three ways that I want to highlight to stay ahead of the curve as there's increasing amount of AI and automation. Um, and overall, I want to let you know that my sentiment on, on AI and automation is, is largely optimistic. Um, I don't think that there's too much to be worried about if you're taking pragmatic steps to stay out of the curve. And I think that the world is going to get better because of AI. Um, but I also want you to know that because it, it, from my subjective perspective, it may influence the way that I'm giving you information today. Um, so the first set of skills I mentioned is uh, human skills. So there are things that uh, AI can do right now that are primarily um, pattern matching. So many of you know about neural networks, deep learning. Uh, th there's a, a category of AI that is primarily focused on taking lots of training data and understanding the patterns in it and then being able to guess uh, the pattern for a future data point. Um, so what's missing from that is in, in humans we have kind of two parts of our brain. We have a pattern recognition part, and then we have a, an associate part. And what the associative part lets us do is it allows us to learn new domains really quickly, and it allows us to apply patterns from other domains to new domains. So uh, creativity is a really important part of what humans can do that uh, largely AI can't do in quite the same way right now. And just to, to talk about the importance of this, there's a, a brilliant guy who works on, uh, talks about the future of work named Josh Burson. I took this chart from him, uh, published uh, earlier this year, and he's talking about the ways that uh, wages and demand for roles and skills have changed over the last uh, 30, 40 years. And primarily, we're looking at people who have great social skills and great math skills in increasing in uh, demand. And what's happening here is that obviously people who can create technology are uh, in demand and then people who can do the things that technology cannot do are in demand. So from that point, I want to I want to talk a little bit about uh, creativity and the different ways that this shows up. So uh, many of you uh, may know about corporate innovation departments. Uh, obviously, in the scope of entrepreneurship, we talk about creating generative ideas being able to synthesize many domains of thought and cr create something completely new from that. So you might have heard about AI uh, actually going out and uh, taking lots of pictures or images and then being able to create new art. And I, I think that that's slightly different than what humans do. 
uh, the AI, like, or even um, natural language generation like GPT-2, uh, what it's doing is it's taking lots of things that humans have done before and kind of recombining them, spitting that back out. And, and that's not to say that that's not art, but I think it, it's creative in a different way. And to, to practice, on, practice and hone the, your own creativity is a really important part of staying ahead of the curve. So what I would break that down into is understanding uh, what, you, what you're passionate about and then also just practicing the act of being creative. Um, a lot of our culture has shifted into very consumption oriented, whether it's a Twitter feed or a Reddit or Instagram. Um, there's so much information available as, as one uh, person already posted. There's so much information um, that it's really easy to be in this constant loop of uh, reading and consuming as much as possible. And especially if it's learning focused, you could just be reading tons of books, but if you're never putting that into action, you're never, uh, stretching the muscle of the creativity that's necessary to, uh, create new companies, create new innovative ideas within large companies. And I think this is one of the things that humans can really, uh, emphasize as you've tried to build your career and stay relevant in the age of AI. And one thing I would do is just uh, it, it's one of those meta skills where if you're practicing creativity, you get increasingly good at creativity in general. So you can just be creative in dance. You can be creative in making music. You could be creative in just brainstorming, generating ideas, writing, and all of those out, uh, creative outlets will help to build uh, creative muscle over time. And by way of that, you'll be more creative in your work too. That's something that I've, I've really, it's really helped me to generate new ideas in, in the realm of entrepreneurship. The other thing that's required in creativity is uh, kind of depth of expertise. So again, that technical expertise, practicing your craft, going really deep into coding or design or whatever it might be. To, in order to be creative, you have to know uh, enough about the, what you're doing and have it kind of be fluent for you such that you could be spending not spending time not on the mechanical details of what you're trying to do but the um the playing on the edges of what people haven't quite done before um the other skill that i think is incredibly important important um and please don't mind the cliche picture is uh empathy and it's empathy is a hard thing to visualize um and why is empathy important is because i think First, machines are not very good at empathy. They're getting increasingly good at computer vision, facial recognition, uh, being able to tell where our emotional as affect is. But a lot of empathy is about um, really hearing what someone is trying to say. And the other part of empathy is making someone feel heard. So this is part of interacting with people that is just absolutely essential. As Josh Burson said, it's one of the increasing uh, domains of skills that are relevant. But in addition to that, um, it's just something that I don't think that AI is gonna be able to do well, at least in the next few years. Um, so ways that I, I would think to practice empathy, um, there's lots of really useful uh, frameworks around communication. Um, my favorite recently has been nonviolent communication is a book by Marshall Rosenberg. Um, and there's other types of, uh, books on leadership and how to bring the social, um, and soft skills in that have kind of increased over time. You can look at things like, uh, the 15 commitments of conscious leadership, um, Brene Brown's work. These are the types of things where I think the workplace is going. And as we get more AI and automation, as we're able to create more wealth, I also think that our workplaces will increase in the kind of requirements that we have to uh, make them feel good to be a part of. So if you're someone who can understand uh, what it feels like, what feels good at, in a manager relationship with a uh, direct report or um, with a customer or with uh, an investor, that's a really essential part of um, doing what AI can't do because the calculations are going to be increasingly automated. The outreach is going to be increasingly automated, but the human to human connection, I think is really hard to automate. Um, and both of these are directly related to entrepreneurship. Uh, entrepreneurship is another really difficult thing to get a picture of. This is actually uh, the 500 startups office um, where I, uh, I work. Um, 500 startups is an accelerator program based out here in San Francisco. And, 
uh, entrepreneurship is both creativity and um, empathy combined with just hardcore execution, uh, the ability to learn quickly. And I often think of it as information asymmetry, uh, which we'll talk about in a little bit in the machine teaching section. So I think, you know, obviously being able to understand information, find and understand information that doesn't already exist in the market or is not already built into the algorithms, which would be another way to, to look at it. And, and then arbitrage that to be able to create a new business that serves customers better via empathy is um, is something that AI is probably not going to be able to do really soon. Um, and, and there's there's an aspect of this that's also a meta skill. So being able to interpret a landscape and understand what are the ways that I can add value here is something that's always going to be valuable. Um, whether you're an entrepreneur or an entrepreneur, or just someone who's in a community, um, figuring out how to add value is, is always going to be something that's inherently uh, valuable. And I think practicing entrepreneurship is a function of practicing the sub skills, um, including, you know, how to be a great manager, uh, creativity and empathy, um, how to sell. And then uh, it's also a function of, of just doing it. Uh, what I've learned is that, for example, being the CEO of IDEA did not translate to being able to be an effective entrepreneur. There's leadership skills that I learned there. There's a network that I learned there. There's exposure to entrepreneurship materials, but it, it's different from um, the actual act of starting a business, which is just difficult in a unique way. It's hard to have transferable skills too. Um, so that sums up the human skills component. Uh, the next set of skills that I want to talk about are the force multiple skills. And these are the types of things where, you know, we live in this really interesting age where everyone here is is, is able to access this information um, via this webinar, via a computer or phone. You know, someone built the technology that is enabling us to share information in this way. Someone built the technology that has enabled me to make this presentation and find the images to include in it. I think the, the one of the most important concepts to think about in the age of AI is that humans now have the ability to create things that scale exponentially. And one of the difficult things about exponential scale is that it's not intuitive to the human brain. Uh, the human brain is, is designed, has grown, uh, evolved into uh, uh, just linear thinking um, and being able to perceive things linearly. Uh, time, space, uh, mathematical numbers. You, you can think about the number 12 and you'd be able to interpret that really easily. You can think of 12 books or, or 12 eggs. Uh, you could probably think about 100, like $100. Um, but if I say 0. 0.000001, th that's just a the theoretical concept. It doesn't have any um, real meaning to me. And if I say 100 billion, again, just a theoretical concept. So there's, there's um, you know, the middle band is the linear thinking that humans are really, you know, good at. Um, and it's, it's hard to necessarily get to an understanding of exponential scale. Um, so what I'm here to tell you is that uh, despite your intuition about um, exponential scale, exponential scale is probably one of the most important things to uh, leverage in the age of AI. So the force multiple skills are all about how you can leverage uh, software, the ability to create software, even without coding, um, to access the exponential scale of impact and of wealth creation and profit that is possible. Um, so the first one, very obviously, is coding, learn how to code. Many of you probably already know how to code. Um, I would say that there's investment in understanding how to code is almost always a good use of time. Um, at the very minimum, general aptitude for understanding coding uh, allows you to work with people who code. That's originally why I studied computer science at Northeastern was uh, very, very early on wanted to make video games. And I wanted to understand how do developers think and how, do, how much time does it take to develop something with nuance so that I can have good conversations from a management and leadership perspective. Um, but what it had evolved into is uh, coding allows me to create small scripts, uh, contribute on uh, a small basis on sites used hundreds or thousands of times, uh, saving myself time personally and impacting many users. Um, so I think, you know, hands down, uh, a great 
great uh, way to build toward a, a capacity to leverage exponential scale. And there's tons of resources for this. Uh, they're getting easier over time. There's you know 50 boot camps, uh, hundreds of online classes. It can be challenging to get into, but I would definitely recommend it if it's something that you're thinking about. Um, the alternative to this is what's happening right now, hearing a ton about in, in Silicon Valley, is the no-code movement. Um, this is on fire. There's uh, about hundreds of millions of dollars that have been invested in the last six months or so into companies like Webflow, Thunkable. Um, these are companies that are allowing people to build prototypes, full prototypes that can ship to an iPhone or Android without code. And, and what's shifted in the last couple of months is that these tools have gotten good enough and the ecosystem has become robust enough that people can create full-on apps without requiring engineering development time. So if you're not someone who can code and you don't want to learn how to code, then this is a really great way to access that exponential scale even if uh, without those necessary skills. And then even if you do code, these are tools that you can use to get prototypes out the door really quickly before going and building a full production ready uh, coding environment. Um, the other thing is that in within teams, if you're someone who codes, this is there's a really great opportunity here to have other people on your team or other people on, on uh, related teams use these types of no code prototyping tools to build tools without asking you for your engineering time or your team's engineering time. Um, and a lot of the kind of Silicon Valley zeitgeist um, communication right now is also that this is, there's in increasingly, it's more democratized than ever for people to build these large scale um, tools and businesses. Um, and that, that to me is really interesting in, in terms of my mission to help the world become more democratized in leveraging AI and the silicon substrate. Um, I would say uh, Webflow is a great great tool to look at in terms of uh, website building, and I'm happy to kind of make some recommendations on other tools that might be interesting. On the back end, uh, Airtable has now become so robust that it's being used as a database, for, uh, like kind of like a proxy database for a lot of these types of tools. And then you have the connection tools like Ift and Zapier that allow you to actually uh, create like really easy to run scripts that will get code from one place to another and, and actually send it all around to make something meaningfully useful. Uh, and then the last thing that I want to talk about is uh, machine teaching. So this has been kind of referred to in uh, a number of different ways. Uh, our you know, about 10 years ago, I heard about it as uh, terabiters. as a, a new um, career for the future. A terabiter was someone that would just produce tons and tons and tons of data um, and, and strap sensors onto themselves and, and go get data from around the world and create data that was valuable. And what we've seen is that uh, there's an exponentially increasing amount of data in the world. And that data has become one of the world's largest resources and most valuable resources. And we have all of these sensors that are um, collecting this data. And, and now the bottleneck is not around the data. It's around uh, making sense of the data. Um, so some of you may have heard of the idea of an, an ETL, or Extract, Transform, and Load framework. And just to explain what that means at a high level, um, extracting is taking data from sensors or some other uh, store and um, pulling it into a usable format. Uh, the transform is to uh, contort that data in a way that makes it meaningful or valuable or useful. And then the load is to put it into another system where then it can be used um, to, for one example, to send to a user to interpret. And uh, what we've seen is a progression from data as a service to insights as a service to knowledge as a service. And knowledge as a service is just growing as a, as a new field. So as, if you're an entrepreneur, if you're thinking about starting a company, knowledge as a service business might be a good, interesting place to look. And then in terms of as someone who's building their career skills, thinking about how you can contribute knowledge uh, to uh, the various platforms that are being built now is a, one way that you might be able to make um, a lot of money. Um, so the key difference here is that uh, the size of the transform in the ETL is much larger in, in each of these categories. So data as a service, you might think of um, if you were buying sales leads, you could just buy names and emails and then blast out emails to people. 
insights. You could get a dashboard that was running on top of your, uh, like Looker is an example, um, running on top of your existing systems and giving you some uh, valuable information about the data that you already have. Uh, and then knowledge uh, is part of what we're building at Team Machine. Um, we're thinking about ways that we can get someone to uh, create a piece of knowledge such as what's the most learning pathway for me to become an effective AI engineer given that I'm currently a cloud engineer um, and then distribute that in the system in a personalized and customized way. So just it's kind of early and I'd be happy to answer questions about this but it's a, a general domain that I would say is, is good to think about and if you're interested to learn more about this there's a great uh, article from uh, Brian Clark at Ascent, um, who, who wrote all about the coming knowledge of service businesses and, and the knowledge economy. Um, and that's a personal interest, so I'm really happy to talk about that more. Um, do you have any questions? Nick, we have a couple of questions. One is, do you, do you see a big difference in terms of learning to code to, one, be able to create apps? and two, access post-process data to increase the level of quality of your analytics? Yeah, definitely. That's a really good question. Um, learning to code is, uh, I, I'm sorry, to, creating apps is very different. Um, so you think about uh, iOS, front-end development, um, there's design components. Uh, the fundamental skills to like code in React are um, kind of like, um, manipulating the interface and then the uh, processing data is more like in the data science category I would say it's co closer to you could kind of think of it almost like front-end engineering versus back-end engineering and uh, I, I would say that they're uh, pretty largely different um, I would say if you wanted to learn how to create apps you might go and start to do no code type of interfaces first and there's lots of uh, online materials and boot camps around app creation and then uh, if you wanted to go down the processing data I would say go to focus more on the data science side that's just a very high level answer. Do you think there is a good way to learn human slash meta skills other than by practicing them consistently? Um, so there's this concept of deliberate practice which is different than just you know practicing um, in general and the, the difference is that deliberate practice is taking something that you are have a difficult time with and uh, doing that to expand uh, like what is your growth edge so I would say uh, practice consistently uh, but then have the intention to practice the things that are particularly difficult for you so if you're a painter um, and you start to get into the mode of uh, painting a certain way uh, try painting uh, with a different medium or painting uh, you know, with a different brush or something that actually pushes you out of your comfort zone to uh, get new neuron connections to actually form in the brain. Um, and that formation process, I think, is what helps on the meta level to develop more creativity over time, for example. Um, so that, that would be the main thing. Just practice a lot and then you know, spend a dedicated amount of time in deliberate practice. Great, thank you. Um, so um, in this section, I have uh, the opportunity to tell you a little bit more about what we're doing um, at Team Machine. And I want to leave time for lots of questions at the end. So I'm just going to give a high level overview of the two things that we really focus on. And then um, if there's not enough questions and I can show you kind of a demo of more about what, how our product works as one example of a learning tool. And if not, then I'll just jump more into, uh, I, I'll just answer the questions. Um, so learning skills, the, what I, the, the emphasis that I want to put here in terms of being ahead of the curve is the first thing is being able to identify which skills are going to be valuable in the marketplace. The second thing is being able to learn uh, very efficiently. So figuring out how to actually learn something, uh, develop a good pathway through the learning materials, sourcing all the learning materials that are available and figuring out which ones are useful to you, and then actually being able to apply yourself to learn more efficiently over time, which like creativity and empathy is a muscle that you can build. 
And then the last one is the ability to use tools from around the web, web to leverage your ability to do these types of things. Um, so the first one, um, when, when we're evaluating people who've used our platform to learn, one of the things that we can bubble up to uh, a recruiter or hiring manager, or someone who actually wants to uh, hire a learner that's been using Team Machine is what we call their, their meta learning skills. And there's four that we look at. Um, learning trajectory has to do with um, their ability to, like how much they've learned consistently over time. So it says not only that this person has these skills, but how long did it actually take to get them? And what it allows someone to do is make a prediction on how much they're gonna learn in the future. So if I hire um, this woman, Angelica, who has an 8.7 learning trajectory, um, maybe she has the skills that I need for uh, her to come in as a, a software engineer right now. But what I'm really excited about is that she's got this incredible trajectory toward learning really quickly in our organization, um, being able to uh, navigate through lots of learning materials and um, figure out how to get to the next step. So she's gonna be increasingly uh, valuable to me as an employee of my organization. The second one we look at here is learning grit. So what is the, the difficulty of the learning materials that this person is taking on relative to uh, their current skill level and how successfully are they able to bridge that gap? If, if they're taking on, uh, if they have a high learning trajectory but they're taking on easy learning materials, then maybe they're taking smaller step functions and this talks a little bit about their learning style. But if someone's able to like jump into something that's really challenging to them and just sit with it and work on it, that's uh, something that may be desirable, especially for um, innovation focused domains, entrepreneurship as an example, or anything that just has like, a large creative uh, jump to be able to produce uh, value within a team. Um, the third one is, Learning efficiency, so how frequently uh, are they coming in and, and uh, consistently actually completing the learning materials that they're given. Um, and then the last one, learning challenge, uh, is is kind of like uh, the, the base, the, the um, numerator of grit. So how much learning challenge are they actually taking on regardless of their ability to uh, complete it? And that's that's a question of like, like how motivated are they to learn? Um, and these are the, you know, basically categories of things kind of, and, and learning grid is a little bit related to the deliberate practice piece and same with learning challenge. This is uh, an important thing because um, these are the ways that we look at what makes someone good at learning. So if you wanted to, you know, develop mastery over the meta skill of, of learning in general, these are the types of things I would, I would suggest that you uh, focus on. And um, as I mentioned, understanding how you learn best is really part of learning, especially outside of the uh, programmatic approach, where in an undergraduate program or in a graduate program, you're given a very specific set of curricula that have been determined by um, uh, either professors who developed over time, a long time and, and iterated on it, or kind of best-in-class approaches from uh, around the nation. Um, and you're in a, a workplace domain or you're trying to do lifelong learning, there's a lot, there tends to be a lot less structure. So making sure that you're really capable of figuring out how you can uh, navigate the learning materials to learn the right things and learn them in a way that's really useful for you is another thing that I would emphasize. Um, the other thing here is uh, the learning tools that are available. So being able to use Coursera and Udemy, as well as the boot camps, um, and, and something like Team Machine, which I think there will be an increasing number of companies that, that are trying to do what, what we're doing. Um, leveraging personalized learning tools, and, and these might be things like Anki, which gives you flashcards to help you um, do spaced repetition, uh, or things from your learning and development uh, programs at uh, co-ops or, or companies that you've worked for. Um, how do you know which tools are actually good and useful for you and how can you develop mastery over them to help augment your ability to learn? Because as the, as the number of skills, uh, as the half-life of skills decreases past five years, um, we're going to continuously need to be learning on the job. And how do we make sure that we're doing these things like deliberate practice and, and finding the right learning materials so that we can move forward efficiently? 
Um, and what you see here is uh, Team Machine uh, creates personalized learning plans. So this is an example of uh, uh, an action plan, part of an action plan that a learner would get as they are on their journey to become a senior software engineer. Uh, or sorry, this is actually for a junior software engineer, for someone who's still in school. Um, but you know, we can create a wide variety of examples. Um, so I can show you from here. Uh, I'd like to hear if there's more questions um, from the audience. And then if not, then I can show you some of the approach that we take within Team Machine. Um, but if there's time for that, then I'd love to go through it. If not, if we do questions for the rest of the time, then I'd be very happy to do that. Are you a moderator? Can you elaborate a bit on concepts, your approach to learning alongside the job? Yeah, so I would say, uh, Florian, that um, there's, like, when you're in the job, there's learning that happens from just being in the job. And that's something that tends to be difficult to quantify. Uh, you know, sitting with your manager and uh, developing a learning plan, say, hey, here are the types of things that I'm really focused on learning. Um, can you help give me projects and materials that are going to be the, the most effective for me to try to learn these skills is, is one negotiation lever that you have alongside uh, asking for raises and promotions. Um, you know, this saying that you're really focused on learning is, is usually impressive to employers, but it also gives the benefit of uh, help having your, recruiting your manager in to help you learn things that you want. Um, and the other type of learning is just, you know, MD learning budget, code of and uh, some, from someone, I'm getting a little bit of feedback on the microphone. Um, so actually going and doing Coursera courses, uh, extension program, like Northeastern offers uh, a number of professional education programs, um, online learning materials, even just watching YouTube videos, staying on top of the latest and greatest technologies. Um, these are all things that I would say is like, are not on the job learning, but may directly affect your ability to implement, uh, to execute skills within your current team, or are kind of in that predictive angle of trying to help someone, uh, trying, to, trying to get ahead of I think we may be having some technical difficulties. I apologize. Hi, can you hear me now? Hello? Yep, Nick, you're back. That's good. Oh, sorry about that. Um, so the last question was about uh, do tools like Thunkable, no code tools have the opportunity to uh, decrease the demand of uh, software developers? And what I'll what I'll share there is that there's an anecdote. Um, the I'm not I'm not 100 percent sure on the attribution, but the there's a quote from the turn of the century, turn of the uh, 19th century. The Attorney General in 1899 said everything that there is to be invented has already been invented. Um, and that was before TV, that was before the internet and computers, uh, blockchain, like, you know, we're, we're on this exponential curve up and there's so much left to be made, we're just barely scratching the surface. Um, and, and the no code tools are always going to be behind uh, the coding tools because they're created by the coding tools. So I think what you'll start to see is that the no code tools are increasingly used for uh, the types of things that people want to automate when they don't know how to code. So one example is my uh, my friend, his, his partner works in HR, and uh, she said, hey, you know, I've got to do this manual task. And it's basically copying, copy and pasting these certain cells into a spreadsheet because we've got to, we have to do some HR reporting. Um, how could I automate this? And the fact that she asked that question is really interesting. But the fact that there's 
uh, the possibility to uh, use tools that are now available to her to automate those types of tasks without being an expert at uh, engineering is, is what I think is really interesting. So I think over time, um, the, the number of engineering jobs will continue to increase significantly. Uh, the number of like no coding types of jobs will start to will start to emerge and then increase. And then the number of people who use these types of tools uh, to create um, automation without needing to code will increase. So the whole market, I think, is going to go up. So it's definitely still a good use of time to uh, it's, uh, spend time learning how to code. Okay, this question, um, if you're not in CS yet and you want to do, you want to advance math, uh, the, you know, the, looking at that chart of high social skills and high math, um, do you think it's better to start with conceptual knowledge uh, versus the actual coding? Um, I, I, I can't give you a uh, market perspective on this question because I'm really biased on, on my angle of this, but I'll tell you my subjective opinion. And my subjective opinion is that conceptual knowledge is really important right now and undervalued. Um, uh, I think someone who asked earlier about going deep into their deep into technical expertise early in their career, I think that's absolutely the right approach. Um, but in general, uh, generalists right now are undervalued because, like someone else said, there's so much information out there. Being able to make sense of it all is something that we need to be able to do and we'll, we'll increasingly need to be able to do. And there's not many people who can do that because there's so many people who are specialized. Um, so if you are the person who tends to be generalist, like likes lots of different things, really enjoys learning, then developing kind of conceptual knowledge of a space or um, even like you know the, the philosophical understanding of the space is, is a really good way to spend time right now. Um, if you're earlier in your career, um, or you uh, want to kind of add this uh, ability to automate things as part of your repertoire, then I would say getting directly into CS, um, there's going to be a huge number of, a uh, huge amount of value that you can bring um, by just uh, understanding the tools for the first time. Uh, and the other thing is, uh, as, an, uh, as an entrepreneur, thinking, being able to think conceptually about these things is really important from a uh, strategy design, from a product design perspective, um, and from a understanding the customer's underlying pain point. Um, so I know that's not really a clear answer, but that, that would be my high-level thoughts. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I, I guess I'll just share a little bit about um, our the way that we think about learning in our in our platform, and to touch on a couple high level points before we end. So I'll share my screen again, um, and I'm not going to go through the whole demo. I'm just going to go really quickly through. Um, uh, the, the main points. So our, our platform is all about building uh, learning agents. Uh, it's like a digital clone of yourself that tests learning plans for you and communicates with all of the other learning agents that are on the platform to understand what might be the best way for you to learn. And then it tells you that most effective way um, and it increasingly learns about you over time. So there's three uh, main steps that we do to get you to a personalized action plan. The first one is that you want to set really specific career uh, or class objectives so that the, the learning agent, which is a type of AI, can direct you in the right direction. So in this case, what we do is we pick some skill objectives. These two are for classes. This one is about going and working at Google, and this one is working at a startup called Synapse. And what this, this is doing is, is giving the AI a goal to optimize for. And you can always change these over time. Um, this one I'll go through really quickly. The, the second step is to assess where your current skills are relative to those objectives. So each of those objectives has some skills that it's, uh, it, you'd need in order to be able to do them. And we're breaking those down really granularly into the amount of time that you've spent learning so far, um, how good you think you are at these individual skills, uh, we can inc incorporate things like external assessments and as well as coding tools where you could do like a hacker rank type 
uh, coding experiment directly in the platform. And then once you do that, you're going to see uh, your skills represented, uh, broken down based on that assessment and the objectives that you're trying to achieve. Um, and you can see that uh, this person who's trying to become a junior engineer, um, their string manipulation skills, one thing that they'll need is a 3.3 out of 10. And in order to pass all of these skill objectives, they're going to need to get to an 8.4 out of 10. And this, you know, the numbers are kind of arbitrary here. Um, and you can see even that like this passing this class to get a grade A is going to be somewhere here like a 4.5. And what this does is it gives you a really granular breakdown of like where am I, what skills do I need to achieve my goals, and then it allows the AI to give you a really clear interpretation of, of how you're going to get there. So next you have uh, a plan that's generated that has a bunch of people who have already successfully achieved your goals and um, it's going to show you how they achieve them. So you can see Vanessa here um, was able to, oh, looks like it's up. Vanessa here was, uh, took the following action plan to achieve these skill objectives. Um, so she did all of these different action items. But there's all of these different learning materials. How do I pick which ones? That's what Team Machine is doing, is it's looking at Vanessa and Brian and Anthony and 55 other peers and it's looking at your specific career objectives, and then it's gonna give you the personalized action plan that says, hey, for you, this is what statistically is gonna be most impactful for your career. So the, at the high level, what we're doing here is you're setting very clear skill objectives, you're figuring out where you are today relative to those skill objectives, and you're breaking down what is actually required for this objective that you have in your career. And then you're charting a path from point A to point B. And in general, regardless of whether or not you want to use Team Machine, I would say that that's a pretty good approach to understand the most effective way to learn uh, the skills that are important to you. Nick, we have um, a question about... Nick, we have a question about how does this scale to more senior level managers who are adult learners, let's say in a doctoral program. Um, this looks like it may be designed for more undergrad or junior people. Yeah, thanks, Margaret. Um, this is a great question. Uh, what I would say is that the the material shown on this particular page is, is just about someone who's mapped a point A that's in a current undergraduate place to a point B that's right after school. But it applies generally to anyone who can uh, measure an assessment context and the skills that are relevant to that job. Um, I would say that anyone could map a career uh, plan in this, but what we need in order for this AI to work is for someone to have input that expertise. We talked about that machine teaching portion of the skills that will be increasingly relevant. What Team Machine is asking people to do on the other side of our marketplace is to, as an expert, as an instructional designer, as an existing hiring manager or a senior level exec, say, here's what I need on my team, then have other people input, here's how I got to that uh, skill level. So then Team Machine is just this kind of uh, abstraction layer that navigates all of those potential knowledge items. Um, career pivoters, senior level one across sectors. Yeah, it's another great question. The way that I would break that down is the career pivoters are, they have some set of skills that are already relevant and you want, we want to be able to understand what in that skill set is applicable to the new career that they want to do. So you might already have a four out of 10 necessary to, to move that skill from one domain to another. And let's give you the exact learning materials that are gonna help bridge the gap rather than something that uh, is gonna start you from, from square one because that's not efficient. Thanks for your question. Nick, Nick our last question is, how did you meet your co-founders? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, my, I'm, I've, I've been really lucky throughout my life and I live in a way that's pretty uh, serendipitous. So um, th it, it was a, a fellow Northeastern alum had invited me, who was working at 500 Startups, had invited me to the Investor Demo Day. Um, I met my uh, co-founder Jonathan because he pitched at that Demo Day. He was talking about video games and teams uh, and AI and I said, whoa, that's really interesting. And we started talking for a while. I invited him to be an advisor for my last company. Um, so we got to kind of work together a little bit and get to know each other better. 
And then um, when my last company failed, I went and worked on ed tech and then slowly started doing more exploration onto the thing I wanted to do next and ended up that uh, it was really well aligned with what Jonathan had been working on already. Um, and since we had known each other and kind of had that uh, working relationship, uh, I, I was open to exploring with him whether we not whether or not we'd have a good collaboration. And then over uh, you know about a six month time frame, discovered that yeah we have symbiotic uh, skills as well as deeply aligned passions and worldviews, um, and it made sense for us to work together. Wonderful. Well, Nick, this is so helpful, and I really appreciate you know, the vast knowledge that you have in this space and how you've been able to um, bring it down to some components that we can really apply and think about for ourselves. And it's also interesting to hear your product and your journey um, as an entrepreneur and how you've practiced um, some of these things. And you have a good insight into what's happening and the impact that we can think about in our own careers. So I really appreciate your sharing your expertise today. This is very helpful and kind of different information for some of us. And um, thank you all for participating and sharing some really great questions as well. We look forward to seeing you at future webinars. And I do apologize for those that may have had some technical difficulties. Thank you so much for joining us. And again, thank you, Nick. This was really wonderful. Thank you. It was such a pleasure. Thank you for having me. And thank you all for, for coming. I really appreciate it.